let us unite.
also with you. Let us pray. O He said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, 
And he said, here, and, and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We join together in the confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From the midst he will come to judge. Thank you. 
shared with Sydney earlier this week, it's not happening. I tried very hard. I tried to preach a separate sermon that I preach at Emmanuel here so that you all have the luxury of being your own congregation and we're not just bleeding in two worlds. I did bring my notes. It just was not flowing the way I hear it, you see it. And I wasn't going to torture you any more than you believe you are to torture you. But it, so that's not happening. Our sermon is going to be based on the gospel lesson today uh, from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. And we're going to discuss what it's like to have your hope return. Luke 24, verses 36 through 49. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Beloved, from grades 1 through 6, I attended St. John Lutheran School in South Euclid, Ohio. I share that to say for recess, we had recess in the cemetery in the back of the school. I share this also because many of you know by now in November, my father was called home to be with the Lord. I can tell you in grade school and today, had someone come out of the grave, I would run across the street. I am no longer playing whatever game we were playing. If my father were to walk in here right now, I'm out. I'm across the street. This whole Michael Jackson thriller video stuff and folks coming out the grave, not buying it. Sell as many records as you want, not hearing it. Right? This, mm, I don't deal with it. Spiritual stuff and spooky stuff, I'm not playing. That is our text today. We, we get excited about Easter and all of the after the facts. You have to take into consideration the folks that we meet in Scripture do not have the luxury, do not have the privileges that we have that for 175 years people have been preaching to us about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's not their reality. We, we are dealing with the resurrection in real time with these folks. And so, as it is today, it was the same in biblical times. It's unthinkable. I mean, you heard, you've read, and you saw the drama when Lazarus was raised from the dead. This is unthinkable. People just don't make bodily appearances. And so even after Easter, you and I, as well as those in the text, have to deal with some truths. Even on this, the third Sunday of Easter, our hearts are troubled. Our hearts still have doubts. Just as the two men that preceded our text on the road to Emmaus, Luke chapter 24, verse 21. Luke chapter 24, verse 21. And there you will find these words. But we have hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. I wonder, dear friends, have you ever been in that Easter kind of reality? Were you listening? It said, we had hoped. You ever been in that place where your hopes and your dreams have been dashed? You expected something, but that's not how it turned out. Oh, you can look at me glazed over with your Sunday morning face. I'll give it to you. I'm going to turn around because I don't want you to laugh and tell you that. You had hoped I was going to be a little quieter as a pastor. You had hopes that I wouldn't preach as long. You, you know what it is to have your hopes dash. You had hoped that after 175 years, it would still be standing room only. Can we get a little closer to your pew? You had hoped that after 175 years, you wouldn't be facing the tension that you're facing as a congregation. We had hoped. We had hoped that the marriage would have lasted. We, we, we hoped that the job would have been a little different. We had hoped that the doctor would have given us a different medical report. We had hoped. We had hoped that those kids by now would have gotten out of the house. Or at least, or at least brought us a glass of water. We, we had hoped. We had hoped that our Messiah, here's what they were wrestling with, we had hoped that our Messiah would have actually overthrown the government. 
We had hoped that our Messiah would not have taken the easy way out and just died on Friday. We had hoped for something different. And now we stand here, three days after Easter, still struggling with hope. And now they find themselves on the road to Emmaus. I wonder if you've ever been on the road to Emmaus. You may not have gone geographically. But my problem with academics and education, as I share with people, I have more degrees than I care to and some credits towards my PhD. But here's my problem. Academically, they're trying to tell us that this might not be the Emmaus Road that we think it's going to be. We've done some digging. It may be another Emmaus Road. Scripture told us it was seven miles away. God said it. I'm done with it. That settles it, right? But you ever been at that place where your hopes and your dreams have been dashed, and now you're on the road to Emmaus? Oh, you've been there. You say it like this. When you get to that point, it is what it is. What it is. Oh, you've been on the road to Emmaus, and if you don't say it that way, you've probably done it the old school way. I give up. That place where you understand that you can't even stress out about it anymore. You don't even care how it turns out. It's so broken, busted, that you're just going to leave it the way that it is. But it's very fascinating, dear friends. It's not until we realize that our hopes and dreams had to die, that we had to find ourselves in that place of submission on the road to Emmaus, that our hope actually returns. But here's the problem that we have to wrestle with spiritually as we are considering the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The reason our hopes and dreams appear to be dashed is they were not rooted and grounded in Scripture. God promised you, give us this day. The reason your hopes and dreams are dashed is you wanted that bread to be toasted. And he never promised you that. I, I, on Easter, the, the, the uh, bread shop not too far from my house, they had sent out some coupons earlier, and they made little bunny breads for Easter. Oh, the grandkids will love that. Let's go get this, right? I go to pick it up Saturday after the gym. I walk in, and this man is standing there with a hunk of warm bread. He was like, do you want a slice? Uh, yeah. He cuts this huge hunk of bread and he slaps some cinnamon butter on it. God said, give us this day our daily bread. Now I need bread with some cinnamon butter on it, right? I have expectations of God with warm bread and cinnamon butter. And if it's not warm bread and cinnamon butter, here's what we do. We want jelly. But all he promised us faithfully was daily bread. And so now we have unrealistic, unbiblically grounded expectations of God and we feel as if we've missed the resurrection because the bread isn't the way that we demanded of God. And so we stand on the road to Emmaus, dazed and confused about our hopes and dreams and God's promises. And so he meets them in this place to restore them and remind them that our peace cannot be defined by external worldly things that we've dreamed of. They have to be defined by the peace that God has promised us based on biblical facts, biblical truths, not our own fantasies. Here's what Isaiah told us in the 53rd chapter, verse 5. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The peace that God has come to bring us, that God offers us, is not the absence of war. It's not the absence of family drama. It's not even good interest rates. And I don't know what's going on with my red in Israel, but this $5 for gas business, it's not that either. That's not what peace is. The peace that God has come to give us and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a right relationship with God. 
Because of the personal work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, regardless of if you got warm bread, warm bread, with cinnamon butter, or jelly, you are in right relationship with God and nothing else matters. And that, dear friends, should bring us, should give us peace. And so Jesus walks into our role of Emmaus and gives us the Word made flesh. Proof that God's Word, Jesus, the Word made flesh, is not going to return to the Father with an incomplete assignment. He has come and accomplished everything that God the Father has sent him to do for you and for me. And his suffering has brought us peace. And so why are we dazed and confused? Now, you all can get excited because we won't crush your hopes. They'll just be dashed. Verses 39, 40, 41, and 42, and 43 all go together. Translation is 70 degrees outside. You can go play in your garden. See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Dear friends, this is this right here, I mean, I am excited about Easter. I am excited to be in right relationship with God. But those verses right there are all the reasons I need to want to hang out with Jesus. The man is a booty. I don't know. Listen, you might not believe the nail prints in my hands, the side that is pierced, the nails in my feet. Can we go to lunch? Does anybody got something to eat? Jesus says on a very basic level, if you didn't believe on my death, burial, and resurrection, watch me break bread. And so here they are. Maybe, maybe, dear friends, that's his go-to move because you know from his birth he was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Here's what he said about himself in John chapter 6, verse 35. John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Imagine this. I don't care how broke and busted life might be. Jesus says, you won't be broke and busted and hungry. You won't be broke and busted and thirsty. He's come to refresh us. He's come to fill us with all of the things in heaven. And that, dear friends, should bring us peace. That as you sit here right now, the world as you know it might be falling down, but that has no barrier between you and your perfect relationship with God. You are still his child, regardless of what's going on. Do you understand it? Do you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And so then the question becomes, now that Jesus says my best because we need to go to lunch, why does Jesus eat? Because even after providing proof of the peace, the disciples still have doubts. Even after all of the proof, even after 2,000 plus years, and the narrative of Jesus has not changed, they have not been able to shake it or disprove it. And so we stand on the foundation of God's word, we still have doubts. Did you hear verse 41? Luke 24, verse 40, 41. And while they still disbelieved for joy and marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Now this is going to require us to tell the truth and shame the devil. We, we still struggle in our hearts whether we are supposed to be excited or afraid that Jesus is alive. We still have doubts that arise in our hearts. Sure, we have shouted with the best of them, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Ooh, you are awake this morning and this morning, right? We, we believe these things. We cherish these things. But the truth of the matter is our hearts are still troubled. We still have some things that are stressing us out. And how can both worlds be true? How can I be so deeply rooted and grounded in the personal work of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but at the same time, can I give you my sister-in-law, please? Just, 
She will constantly say when things go wrong. Child. <laughs> we, we look at the cross and we immediately say, Child, what is going on here? What is wrong? What has just happened in our lives? Mark chapter 9, verse 24 explains our reality like this. Mark chapter 9, verse 24. I'm sorry. Mark 9, 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Have you ever been there? Oh, you're convinced that Jesus got up from the grave. You are convinced that you are most certain. Extended the right to be in heaven. It is yours. Look, blind and sinker, locked in. Jesus has done all the work. But right now, in this very moment, you're going through some stuff that is making you question whether Jesus is real or not. I believe. But help my unbelief. That doctor called my phone one more time. Like it made me look at my chart one more time. I believe. But help my unbelief. They call me about this or that one more time. Our family is going through a situation that I've never seen before. I believe. Help my unbelief. They're laying people off in ways we have not seen before. I believe, but... And so we stand on the road to Emmaus, torn with joy and doubt. Belief, but bewildered. And so we got to get back in the text. Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You see, dear friends, God is very consistent in his approach to us and the way in which he desires to communicate with us. It is by his word. In the beginning, God created. And he said, let there be light. Let there be light. We fast forward. In the beginning was the word, and the word was made flesh. Was made flesh. And that very word came and dwelt, tabernacle among us. But do you listen to the word? He is very consistent in how he desires for us to meet him, hear him, see him, be in relationship with him. It's through his word. As a matter of fact, in Luke, his very first sermon preached, Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 22. Here are the very words he first preached. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? The problem, dear friends, is you and I get caught up in the presentation. What does it look like? Or, or let, let's break this back down again. Was the bread warm with cinnamon butter? And we miss what God has spoken to us. He said that all of Scripture has been fulfilled. But we're worried about, wait, well, is Joseph's son? Should they be building a house or something? Be focused on carpentry or something like that? Why is he talking to us about godly things? And we miss the word that God has given us to bring us peace. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Here's Jesus again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. Or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until it is all accomplished. So don't be surprised, dear friends, that Jesus returns them, as he does us, to the word. His ministry is the fulfillment of God's word. In our hearts and in our minds. We have to ask the question, are we open to God's word? Because that is where we find our hope. That is where we find our joy. That is where we find our fulfillment. Jesus shows us that he is the New Testament promise to the Old Testament prophecy. And we need to be focused on repentance and the forgiveness of sins. Nothing else, dear friends. Nothing else. 
is important other than the salvation of our souls. It is that serious. Here's what happened. Luke chapter 16, verse 34. If you will remember, the rich man dies and he goes to hell. And he is struggling with this reality. This heaven and hell thing is very real. And he says, will you please send somebody back from the dead to go tell my family that this is real? We got it wrong. You got to tell them. You got to tell them. Here's what Abraham said to him in reply. Luke chapter 16, verse 31. Now take into consideration. Here's the scene. Here's a rich man who has died. He has gone to hell. He wants to make sure that his family doesn't experience the same fate. You got to want to go to heaven. Here's what Abraham tells him. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. If you don't believe God at his word, if you don't believe God at his word, even somebody returning from the dead cannot convince you. Uh, growing up, I was a huge follower of Joyce Meyer. Don't know if you know her, but her story fascinates me because she was born and raised in Missouri City, Luther. The church body told her, you women can't do this stuff. We'll leave that for another day. She then goes on to be Joyce Meyer that we all know. She utters the phrase regularly. If God himself cannot convince you, I don't have a chance. If the word of God cannot convince you to be a person of hope and joy and secure in your position with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, nothing else is going to change that. The question, dear friends, becomes, do you believe God at his word? Because his word is his bond. It is the very thing that grounds you and I. Nothing more, nothing less. Else. Do you trust his word? And then verse 45 of our text, Luke chapter 24, says, Then he opened their minds to understand scripture. A closed mind. How many of us approach God with a closed mind? A mind that's not willing to consider a different idea or a different opinion. We are so committed to this world and all that it has to offer that Jesus becomes an afterthought. We are just simply here on a just in case. Just in case this is right, I might as well cover my bases. I got a few minutes before it gets too hot, I can still get home. We went to church. By the way, did you pick up some groceries on the way? We went to the store. Watched my sports team lose, right? We, we, we check it off. But the question becomes, are we really committed to the word of God for the salvation of our souls? Because when we consider what God is speaking to us, it is drastically different than what the world has to offer. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so we're wrestling between those two worlds. It's not that God has forsaken us. We think our thoughts are better than God's. We constantly go to God and place things in his suggestion box. Dear friends, the reason our hopes and dreams are dashed and to tell you this, he ain't responding to that. He's not listening to that. Because that which we continue to offer him does not give us true joy, does not give us pure hope and confidence in the relationship with God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 explains our lives and realities this way. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We have to daily renew our mind and align it to the word of God. 
We, we cannot allow our minds to remain stuck on the things of this world and be closed off to the things that God desires for us to hear and receive. And so he opens their mind to scripture. And so, dear friends, what prevents you from having an open mind to the word of God? He closes his interaction with these men on the road to Emmaus in a very, very interesting way. Because in order to have your hope return, not only means that you have to open your mind to the reality of what God has promised us, it also requires something of us. And I know for good old Lutherans that bothers us, right? Because we hang our hats spiritually. For by grace we have been saved through which means we have the luxury to sit here on these nice cushioned pews on a nice warm day and have the doors open and know we ain't got to do nothing. Well, I have to disturb you a little bit. That difference is called justification. As a church body, we also teach justification and sanctification. There is no way you hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and just sit there in a cushioned pew. We are motivated by the gospel to want to do things for others. And so we come to the end of this text very interestingly. Verses 46 through 49. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. He's giving them a checklist. Y'all, this happened. And that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. This is happening. Translation, charity should start at home. You can't come sit in church all week and say, I went to church, and then go home and be a hell yeah. There's a contradiction. We have to understand that for many, we are the first and only Bible that people will read and meet. And so are we preaching to the nations and to our home folks? Watch this. Verse 48. You are witnesses to these things. You are a witness to these things. People are expecting you to have a word from the Lord to point them to the cross. You mean to tell me on Sunday morning you didn't go home, you went to church? Please tell me about this. And the question becomes, do we have an answer? And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Jesus, in returning their hope, giving them a future, not only opens their minds to Scripture, but gives them a promise and an assignment. For those of us who are unaware, you do know that the Gospel writer of Luke also pins the book of Acts. And so it becomes very fascinating that the chapter should close this way. And what disturbs us, again, we have to look at the balance of our lives. We get frustrated because society has taught us, and you probably already have yours written out, so I don't mean to disturb you, because my mother has already told me, Mondays are when you plan your schedule. I've got to call my doctors, get my doctor's appointments, and map out the rest of the week. So you have your six things to do on your to-do list. But see, you also have done something else that's going to interrupt that. You have also humbly prayed when God in his infinite wisdom interrupts your little to-do list. Don't tell the people that you start cussing. That's okay. We'll, we'll talk about forgiveness and repentance later, right? He, he wants to know, are you willing to be obedient to the word? How many of us jump off and start doing things without the power of God's leading and guiding? After you write your to-do list, how often do you say, the Lord willing? Do you even consider that God can have something else for you to do? A few years ago, I was invited to Warsaw, Indiana to preach for a congregation. And the pastor called me and he said, why were you all in our business? Because my thing was, we plan, God directs. How often do we have things we want to do, but we don't pause or give God room to move? And so when he blows our lives up with his kingdom coming and his will being done, because we do confess that, right? I don't know the last time we confessed it off the catechism. His will and his kingdom will be done with or without us. We don't have to beg him. And, and, and so 
therein lies the tension that we find ourselves back on the road to Emmaus. But we want the power of the Holy Spirit to come to us. And he gives us a very important command on the road to Emmaus. Stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Don't move until I tell you. How obedient are you to the word of God? Does God have the authority, the ability to tell you? Oh, I know you all are a little churchy. Uh, my, as you can't tell, scripture just comes alive. We just have a conversation. Does God have the authority to tell you to sit down and shut up? Or is it your way and your way only and God will drag you along? You treat him like the little higher thing in the back, breaking case of emergency? He says, sit down and wait until the power comes. And then that's how Luke closes. And then you get excited because on Pentecost it says, and when the day of Pentecost came and they were all gathered in one place, they stayed in the city like Jesus told them to. And then the power of the Holy Spirit comes. I wonder, I wonder if your hope could be a little deeper if you would submit to what God is asking you to do. I wonder if your hope would return if we were willing to be obedient on this road to Emmaus. That maybe the reason our hope left is because we were too busy doing our own thing. We thought that Jesus was gone. We thought that Jesus was absent. And so we just took off doing our own thing as opposed to sitting down and examining what he actually said to us. Because there is a difference. And so I just stopped by this morning to let you know this one thing. As you sit here with the world falling down around you, everything is okay. Everything is perfectly fine in your life because you are in right relationship with God because of the personal work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of this stuff that we are worried about, you can't take it to heaven. In my line of work, I've been with families at the time of funeral, day in and day out. I have yet, this is my 17th year of officially doing this. You know what I have not seen in 17 years? Even, even in grade school, when we were playing at the cemetery, I have not seen a single person bring a U-Haul truck with all this stuff. <laughs> the stuff we are worried about has no ramifications with our eternal reality, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When you're gone, nine times out of ten, and we told this to our parents, please decide what you want, because we're calling 1-800-GOD-JUNK. Because the only thing that matters is that you are a child of God. And that has happened for each and every one of us. And allow that to be your security and your hope. And allow the Word of God to bring you what Jesus says to them in the opening part of this text, peace. And in his name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Beloved, as you are able, we rise together and we join together in the offering.
the 21st at 12.30, right after the service. It's entitled Love and Honor One Another. If you have questions, you can talk to Renee Burrows, Pat Couch, or Cindy Smith. The annual flower sale is coming up. It will be from May 9th through May 19th, just in time for Mother's Day. There is a flyer in the bulletin today regarding that. If you would like to help out in any way, and we can use the help, please see Pat or Bob Couch. The summer camp, St. John's is now accepting registrations for our summer camp. This is what we call Discovery Depot. It will run from June 17th through July 26th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. for ages 6 through 12. Cost is $2.25 per week per child. Lunch and snacks will be included. And extended care will be available before and after hours. Anyone interested can call the office to reserve a spot. Thank you for donating your old and new glasses, and please continue to do so. And just a reminder, if you are able, there are green envelopes in the back there, or as you come in the door, that you can contribute to the 175th anniversary. Again, there are there, and just put them in with the regular, um, regular offerings. Anybody else have any announcements? The lady with the hat. Okay. Um, hello. Um, ladies, where will we be next Sunday after church? I know how you feel, Pastor. They don't talk. Tea party. <laughs> okay. Um, everyone is welcome. Please come if you're able. And um, we are asking that if you can come Saturday morning, we'll be there starting about 9 o'clock in the, in the uh, kitchen. Preparing, we have about 140 people attending. It has really exploded. Um, God bless. Uh, and so we are going to need a little help feeding them and preparing the sandwiches and the, and the desserts and everything. So if you can give us a hand, we'll be there Saturday morning, um, and that would be very much appreciated. Also, if there are any gentlemen, please, we don't want you to feel left out. We have a special gentleman's table. We have some very special um, gentlemen that are wanting to help us uh, serve these ladies, and so we would appreciate any help in that area as well. Just let either me or Pat or uh, Bob Couch um, or Cindy know. But, yes? 9 o'clock. And we'll be there a long time. So try to prepare everything um, to uh, feed the masses. Okay. Um, and don't forget, we're going to have a lovely Bible study by Pastor Reeves. We're going to have... Um, <laughs> tea, <laughs> um, a lovely luncheon, and um, just get together for a nice time. Thank you. And just to reiterate, the men can come at nine o'clock too and help set up. <laughs> Anybody else have any announcements? <laughs> There's one thing that's been weighing on me, St. John's. I want to make sure you know. Love you, St. John's. We love you too. Thank you.
upon us the forgiveness of sins to reign among husbands and wives, parents and children, and that he would assure those who live alone that they too are his children, upheld by his right hand. Let us pray to the Lord. For help and healing, that the God of all comfort would have compassion on all who are afflicted. We pray today for all of our brothers and sisters on our sick and shut in this, but more specifically today for our will having a medical procedure this week and prayers of thanksgiving that Mike has been returned home from the hospital. Let us pray to the Lord. Amen. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we do not have to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the name and the power. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Beloved, our closing hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, hearts to heaven. 